Signal is a podcast by the Bucks County Beacon. I'm your host and the Beacon's Editor-in-Chief, Cyril McGlaco. Twice a month, we'll use this space to shine a light on the right-wing extremist currents streaming through Bucks County and beyond. We'll talk to guests who will help listeners navigate these perilous political waters by providing insight, analysis, and organizing solutions so that we can steer the community toward calmer, saner, progressive routes. Ann Kim is a writer, lawyer, and public policy expert. She is a contributing editor at Washington Monthly. Her work has appeared in the Washington Post, Governing, The Atlantic.com, The Wall Street Journal, Democracy, and numerous other publications. Today, Ann joins us to talk about her new book, Poverty for Profit, How Corporations Get Rich Off America's Poor. Hi, Ann. Welcome to The Signal. Thank you for having me, Cyril. To start off, why did you decide to write this book, Poverty for Profit, How Corporations Get Rich Off of America's Poor? Yeah, this is actually a topic I've been pursuing for, you know, more than a decade at this point. You know, I've been writing about social policy for a long time and couldn't help but notice that in pretty much every aspect of poverty programs I was looking at, whether it's nutrition or housing or tax credits for working poor families, there was some private for-profit company kind of lurking in the background. And it got me curious to kind of understand how much of what we're spending on poverty programs is actually going to for-profit companies versus the people who are supposed to benefit from all the welfare programs that we've created over the past couple of decades. And the answer is the companies are profiting a lot. So 60 years ago, LBJ declared a war on poverty. How are we doing? Are we winning? (laughs) That's a really complicated question, right? On the one hand, uh, we, the programs that were created back in those days and the programs we've created since have made tremendous impact on reducing poverty. You know, senior poverty is less than half what it was back in LBJ's day. Child poverty is down a substantial amount. On the other hand, if you look at the poverty rate last year, like 11.5%, You can say it's kind of unchanged from where it was in the late 1970s. So I think it creates a lot of um, public frustration, perhaps, about whether these programs are working and what can we do better. And the purpose of this book, Poverty for Profit, in some sense, is to point the finger at a set of players that hasn't really gotten a lot of attention so far. And it is these middlemen who are actually administering the programs and really diminishing their effectiveness by their profit taking and by the poor service that they provide in so many contexts. The federal government spends about $90 billion a year on this war, but you know, like you've mentioned, it's, it's outsourced, you know, quote unquote, fighting it in many ways to these private contractors, right? They're awarded multi-million dollar contracts. And then these corporations are then tasked with carrying out what had been traditionally government duties, um, such as providing social social services in areas such as healthcare, housing, job training, criminal justice, etc. Before we get into what you describe as the the corporate poverty complex, profiteering off of poor Americans, explain how and when we got to this moment where we started privatizing government. Yeah, sure. And it's 900 billion actually per year, and that's actually a conservative estimate. A lot of that spending is is healthcare, but there's quite a bit of it that goes to those services that you outline. This question of privatization begins back with Ronald Reagan. <laughs> He's the guy, as you know, some of your listeners may recall, who said that you know government is not the solution, but government is the problem. He became a real champion of this notion of privatization and commissioned two, you know, sort of blue ribbon commissions to kind of look at this idea. And back then, back in the 80s, you know, there was this mythology around the CEO. You know, you had Lee Iacocca and you had Ross Perot and God save us, we had Donald Trump out there. And there was a mystique around the CEO being this efficient titan who could, you know, bring, do everything better, faster, cheaper. And the idea was to bring that into government. So Reagan imported this idea into government, had these two commissions, and they came up with these you know, multi hundred pages, hundred pages of recommendations uh, offering to uh, recommending to privatize everything from air traffic control to prisons, to garbage collection, to Medicare, you name it. 
uh, they said, you know, the government can't do it anymore, but business can do it better. And the Reagan um, administration actually set about doing that. And that's what we've seen over the last, since the Reagan administration, and actually even with President Bill Clinton. He too ran on a platform of, quote, reinventing government. And reinventing government in a lot of ways meant privatizing it. And one of the things that happened with the 1996 welfare reform legislation that he signed was to end a federal prohibition on privatizing social services, human services. States couldn't have for private for-profit actors making Medicaid decisions on behalf of residents. But the 1996 welfare law did away with that. And so now all of a sudden you had welfare contractors coming in and making all of these decisions that once were in the purview of the state. Could you apply for welfare? How much could you get? Could you apply for Medicaid? How much could you get? If you have a claim, can you be denied? All of these are now in the hands of private for-profit players in a lot of places, including Pennsylvania. So this couldn't have happened without some public support. I mean, what was it about this moment where the public was buying what the public and some in the Democratic Party uh, were buying what Reagan and these free marketeers were selling? Yeah, sure. I mean, it's always been politically popular to bash big government as wasteful and fraudulent and blah, blah, blah. And both parties have made it, have uh, found it very convenient to make big government the villain. And when Reagan came into office, there had been quite a bit of uh, increase in social spending as a result of the war and poverty. Reagan also managed to racialize welfare and turn the quote unquote welfare queen into a scapegoat for all of this alleged fraud and waste and abuse uh, that he was hanging at on the on, you know on government's neck. So that ginned up a lot of and coupled with the mythology of the you know powerful CEO who could do it all. Those two things together really did kind of create this groundswell of public opinion in favor of let's give business a shot at running government since government can't do it. And then at the same time, you had a lot of failures in the Democratic Party to <laughs> nominate successful presidential nominees. You know, Kerry couldn't do it. Dukakis couldn't do it. All of them had that big government label around their necks, too. And so Bill Clinton, as the quote unquote new Democrat, came in co-opting pieces of the Reagan agenda for political gain. The problem is that the policy impacts in the long term of that co-option of Republican ideas has been catastrophic for the safety net. Was the media complicit in advancing these narratives uncritically at all? Um, because, you know, you look, I have this idea of the media kind of being a little more working class or at, at least covering labor and, and, and poverty as like beats. I think now it's like more, you know, corporate. You just have like a business section, right? And, and, that, and that essentially is just kind of um, parroting the current the concerns of these, you know, mythic CEO figures that have been created in the country. But did you know, can, can you talk about kind of like the media coverage of, of this at the time and whether or not, you know, they had a hand in turning public opinion? That's a really good question. I am not a, an expert on media at this stage, but I would say that a lot of the coverage of welfare reform, for instance, was very uncritical. You know, and there was a lot of excitement around, you know, oh, wow, reinventing government. This seems really cool. And, you know, maybe this will work. And then around the welfare program in Wisconsin, for example, which was the first welfare reform uh, experiment that later became basically codified in the national law. There's a huge amount of like hagiographic coverage of Tommy Thompson, who was the governor of the Wisconsin at the time, for having reinvented welfare and got all these welfare moms working and blah, blah, blah. It turned out <laughs> that maybe that program was not nearly as successful as touted. In fact, it was something of a failure. But at the time, nobody saw the clay feet. And nobody was thinking about the long-term implications of privatizing huge swaths of government. Uh, and here we are, 40 years in, with a system that's going to be very, very, very difficult to unwind as a result. So can you provide one or two examples of these poverty profiteers gaming the system and order to exploit the poor and pad their profits at the taxpayer's expense? Yeah, sure. Um, 
The book is organized kind of into different arenas of programs like nutrition and housing, tax credits. The other way to think about it, though, is that there are kind of three categories of profiteers that I like to think about. The first category is the the skimmers, the people who literally skim off of government benefits intended for low-income Americans. The second category are kind of these monopolist contractors who have kind of a lock on government contracts to provide services in the states uh, or federally. And then the third category you have are these opportunists, you know, their client base, their customer base, so to speak, are is poor people. And they take advantage of systemic persistent poverty to maintain a market for themselves. Um, so just really quick examples of each of the three of these. Prime example of these skimmers are tax private tax repairs. You know, the earned income tax credit is a tax credit for working poor families that's actually one of the largest federal anti-poverty programs out there. So $57 billion returned to families in 2022. Uh, In Pennsylvania, there were 784,000 families who claimed the EITC for almost $2 billion last year, and the average credit was about $2,400. The tax repairs will charge hundreds, sometimes up to half of the amount of the refund to prepare someone's taxes and or to provide basically a predatory fast cash refund advanced product. They're basically taking another tax on top of the tax credit that's due to a family. So that's an example of a skinner, skimmer. These monopolist contractors are the guys who run Medicaid managed care, uh, like in Pennsylvania, you know, 60, more than 60% of the Medicaid money runs through some private company that's making Medicaid coverage decisions for residents in Pennsylvania. There are huge companies that people don't know, like Maximus, you know, when you call 1-800-MEDICARE, you're not actually talking to an employee for Medicare. You're talking to an employee for Maximus at a call center, you know, <laughs> that's based in Tyson's Corner down by my way in Northern Virginia. And then the opportunists are the folks like bail bondsmen, you know, the people who sell uh, commissary items in prisons, you know, the <laughs> dialysis centers who take advantage of the fact that most people with kidney failure tend to be low income, disproportionately a minority, uh, because that is a result of decades of disparities in access to healthcare. So what's the solution? Is it more reform, oversight, and accountability? Or would we need something more transformational, like a, a deprivatization of these services and remove corporations from the equation altogether? Yeah, and that's a really big question because, you know, like we've been talking about, this is a process that has been going on for decades. And I think for each program, there may actually be a different set of solutions. Um, Some of it is actually clawing back governmental power. Like, do you really want the state to decide life or death decisions on healthcare? Yes. Do you want private companies making those decisions? Maybe not. You know, Congress didn't have to allow the privatization of Medicaid, for instance. So that is something that has happened only fairly recently and could be rewound or re-regulated in such a way that there is a lot more oversight. Um, Iowa, for example, found that when they uh, privatized Medicaid, the contractor that they hired had the had uh, denied claims at a rate that was far higher than happen under the state. I mean, those are the kinds of outcomes, outcomes we don't want. And that's the kind of place where you do want to claw back our governmental power to protect people's lives. In other instances, like the earned income tax credit, the federal government actually is moving forward with direct file, which is a free uh, tax filing option for people who have the ITC. However, it only reached 140,000 families last year, and states have to choose to Uh, participate in a program. So that's something that could happen, but it's going to be a long while before you have a universal option to be able to file for free and get your money for free rather than having to go to, you know, the mom and pop predatory tax prep guy down the street. Um, Same with housing vouchers. Uh, HUD is experimenting potentially with giving cash to people who are eligible for subsidies rather than using a voucher because the voucher really limits the choices that you have because you have to find a Section 8 landlord who's willing to take your voucher. And a lot of times, you know, those guys don't offer the best options. So I think the, the, the solutions really vary by program, and that's what makes it very difficult to unwind all of it. Some of it I think you can do, some victories you can have. 
the biggest thing the government can do is kind of get a handle, <laughs> first and foremost, on who are these guys? How much money are they getting? Are, is everyone aware that a company called Maximus earned about $4.9 billion in revenues on government pro- government contracts last year? And a billion dollars of that was gross profit? I mean, that's that tells you by itself there's a lot of inefficiency going on if they're making 20% gross profit off of administering these contracts for the states and federal government. Somebody kind of needs to look into that (laughs) and figure out how we can make those contracts a little bit more efficient and make sure that Maximus is doing a good job. I mean, it seems like your book is almost like an uh, an indictment of almost like the the system, right? Like, you know, you say, don't hate the players, hate the game. Well, the game is like free market capitalism, right? And privatization and, deregula- and deregulation, which, you know, politicians you still hear even today, like campaigning on more deregulate deregulation or even like, you know, the dismantling of public education in order to privatize it, which is, um, you know, something that's, you know, Pennsylvania has been ground zero on. Yeah, I 100% agree. I mean, I, I'm not anti-corporate, actually. I'm not anti-business. I mean, I think that innovation is possible because you have free market and capitalism. However, the profit motive doesn't really work in the realm of social services and poverty reduction, where it's difficult to manage the outcomes, it's difficult to measure and incentivize exactly what you're going after. I'll give an example from the book where I talk about an experiment that was intended very well, but turned out very badly. And that is an effort to try to create, to use social impact bonds to finance um, universal pre-K or or preschool program in Salt Lake County, Utah. And so this was a Goldman Sachs thing and social impact bonds. The idea sounds really good. The idea is to have private actors come in and invest in some, something like pre-K or preventive services or whatever, and then they get their money back if there's an outcome at the end of the process, that is what they're looking for. So in this case in Salt Lake County, Goldman Sachs, a um, bunch of other foundations and private you know, actors invested in paying for pre-K and they would get paid if the kids who benefited from the pre-K program did not have to do special education some years later. And so huge, you know, fanfare around this effort, because it'd be transformational in funding pre-K across the country, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Goldman Sachs get their first payout, several thousand dollars, several hundred thousand dollars, excuse me, when that first cohort of kids allegedly avoids special ed because of this pre-K program that Goldman Sachs financed. Well, according to the New York Times and a bunch of child care experts <laughs> that they interviewed, they had kind of measured the wrong thing. And Goldman Sachs was paid for stuff they probably shouldn't have. They were paid for kids avoiding special education when they may never have needed it in the first place. And then the amount of investment that Goldman had made in the pre-K program was under $2,000 per child. And pre-K experts are like, there's no way that you can have a good pre-K program for that little money. You know, So it turned out to be not nearly as successful as they had hoped. And I think it's a good parable of how even the best intentions fall flat in the reality of these very complex programs and very, it's really hard to get one-to-one, you know, incentive outcome when you're talking about people and poverty reduction and social problems. I mean, I'm very skeptical of like corporations and them kind of doing being motivated by altruism, right? That, that's my bias. Right? I'm not saying that they're incapable of it, but do, do you think they went into this like knowing that they were going to get profit from this and get and potentially get paid for for things that they weren't necessarily responsible for, or is that just kind of government bumbling? I, I mean, who knows, right? <laughs> I mean, to give them the benefit of the doubt, you know, they probably did look at this as part of their kind of like, you know, ESG portfolio, so to speak, like trying to do well by doing good. And and that is kind of a mantra you hear all the time. It's like, oh, you can do double bottom line, triple bottom line. And honestly, I think it works if you're talking about something with a very large consumer market, like fair trade coffee, sure, you know, um, versus like regular coffee, when, when there actually is a market with a lot of choices. But when it comes to something like pre-K, 
<laughs> and the customers, who are the customers, the kids, the government, it's, it's really not that easy to, you don't have a marketplace, number one, that's real. And it, it's really difficult to define a program that's going to that's gonna do it. I, I would like to give these social entrepreneurs the benefit of doubt, you know, and I think a lot of them are motivated by the right things, but they come across like this fundamental structure of capitalism that makes it very hard to get what they're after. Yeah, I mean, you know, to, just to verge off topic just slightly, I mean, even like, you know, global institutions like the World Bank, which is supposed to like alleviate poverty, fall into these same traps, right, on, right. The, on the more massive scales. But okay, so are there any countries who you think run their welfare state or handle their social safety net effectively and that could potentially be a model that the U.S. government could could learn from? You know, I'm not an expert on that particular question, so I probably could not answer that okay. knowledgeably. Sure. Uh, I, I can tell you that the United States seems to be a lot less efficient than a lot of other places that have been held up as models. We have a lot less bureaucracy and a lot less... Um, in America, we have this political belief, I guess, that the, only the deserving poor are the ones who uh, should be worthy of receiving government aid. And that's why, for instance, with the earned income tax credit, it is only for working families and working families with kids, because we've decided that from a political standpoint, um, you don't get money from the government unless you are trying, you have a job. But what that does, or we don't trust you to just spend cash, which is why we give you a voucher instead of just money to go get housing or to go get food. And so what that does is that it creates this bureaucracy that exists in between the benefit and the beneficiary. And that middle infrastructure is where a lot of the rent-seeking and profit-taking occur because that opportunity has been created by the bureaucracy that we have uh, invented in order to create barriers to access to benefits for those who are quote unquote deserving. So, so that it, is that part of the kind of, you know, pull yourself up by your bootstraps mythology of the American dream that, you know, people like to regurgitate? Yeah, hundred percent. I mean, this goes back to like our Puritan <laughs> origins as a country. If you work hard and play by the rules, et cetera, uh, and this notion that if you are poor, it is somehow a moral failing. And, and that, I think, is something that's really steeped into our politics and has found its way into the structure of anti-poverty programs. Uh, but it makes the programs extremely inefficient because we basically don't trust low-income Americans to look out for their own interests uh, in, in a way that benefits them, which is why we're not willing to just give people cash. We have to have some sort of voucher or some sort of infrastructure or some or the other sort of um, mechanism to regulate how people receive and use the benefits that we think that they are deserving of. And it's just remarkable that it seems like, you know, the general public doesn't have the same distrust or cynicism of corporate welfare you know, which, which we yeah. kind of hand out, you know, um, you know, very loosely. <laughs> oh, yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, it's amazing how many subsidies go to all sorts of companies, right? And then only later, we find out that the corporations have abused those subsidies, too, you know, and probably to, and at a scale that's much more um, significant than any individual low income person is. Uh, and, and, they're, and they're probably not, you know, that's, that's the thing. And, and what, why, why do you think this isn't a bigger issue? I mean, you know, after reading your book, this, this seems like something that should be front and center of maybe a presidential campaign. I don't know. Yeah, well, thank you. Um, it's, it's complex, right? I mean, the, the book asks you to think about, like, how we run government, who runs government, you know, what do we owe low-income Americans? How do we get here, you know, over 50 years? And... So it's very hard to distill that down into something like as simple and unfortunately as dumb as build a wall or, you know, the, the sloganeering that lends itself to presidential campaigns, unfortunately, these days. And I think we're still in a very anti-government mode of thinking. And there is this larger project that needs to happen out there about how do you rebuild faith, not only in, in government, but in all institutions. And so... 
this book is out there, but it's very much swimming against the political tide currently, unfortunately. And I don't know how you turn that around. If you have ideas, I, I'm, I'm so glad that you're doing your podcast because this is what your podcast you. is about. Absolutely. You're fighting the tide and it's got to happen at some point. So to wrap up, you know, after hopefully listeners go to their local bookstore and pick up your book, Poverty for Profit, could you recommend a couple other authors or new books that you've read recently that you think would be, you know, good accompaniments uh, to your new book? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, Natalie Foster's The Guarantee is a really good example of uh, kind of a new vision of what social policy could look like. And she also is a fellow New Press author. Senator Jeff Merkley actually put out a book also with the New Press on the filibuster, you know, and uh, reforming that. And I think it's actually a good way to think about how do we get things through Congress, you know, and he's not advocating for getting rid of it altogether. He's talking about reforms so that you have a much more productive uh, process in the Senate, which, which, which we've lost. And I would actually recommend going back and reading some of the older stuff as well to understand how we got here and how we think about poverty in America. So Francis Fox Pippen's Regulating the Poor is a really good book. It's old, but the frame that she creates, that what we're doing is not helping the poor oftentimes with programs, but regulating them, corralling them, controlling them, is a really useful way to think about how governmental programs have often stripped dignity from low-income Americans and um, really limited their opportunities rather than expanding opportunities for people to get ahead. Well, and thank you so much for taking the time uh, to join us today. Um, you know, I encourage everyone to dig deeper into this topic and buy Anne's extraordinary new book, Poverty for Profit, How Corporations Get Rich Off of Americans Off of America's Poor at your local bookstore. And Anne, thanks again so much for the work that you do. Thank you so much, Cyril, for having me. This has been The Signal, a podcast by the Bucks County Beacon. I'm Cyril Michaleko, Editor-in-Chief and Host. For more progressive news, analysis, and opinion from Bucks County and beyond, go to www.buckscountybeacon.com.